Imagine you are a swift fox living in the Alberta prairie. Your world consists of the open prairie where you nibble on grasses and berries and prey on grasshoppers, mice, or even the occasional rabbit. As you travel through the prairie, you are alert for other creatures such as eagles, hawks, or wolves that might kill you for food. These are some ways that you and the other animals you share the prairie with interact with one another. You also interact with the prairie itself. The prairie is the place where you dig your dens, find your food, and raise your young. Ecology is the study of the relationship between living organisms and their environment. An ecologist is someone who studies these relationships. An ecologist studying swift fox, for example, might study where they build their dens, what they eat, or how they raise their young. Ecologists also explore the relationships between humans, animals, and the environment. Imagine these tiny foxes almost entirely disappeared from Canada until they were recently reintroduced. The last swift fox in Alberta was seen in 1928. What happened to these creatures? This is the sort of question that ecologists can help us answer. It turns out that hundreds of swift foxes were accidentally killed in the early 1900s when people were using poison to control the wolves and coyotes that preyed on them. As well, swift foxes lost most of their natural home, the native prairie grasslands. When this land was taken over for agriculture and other human development, such as cities. Now, humans are helping the swift fox. New programs are reintroducing swift foxes to the prairies and groups of concerned citizens are working with ecologists to ensure that swift foxes have the type of home that they need. This topic introduces you to ecology, the interactions between organisms, including people, and the places where they live. Imagine you are a cave dweller long before the days of television, grocery stores, and the invention of the wheel. What are the things that you would need to survive? If your list of basic needs includes food, a place to live, habitat, um, air to breathe, water to drink, you would be absolutely right. These are the basic needs that all living things require. And you share these basic needs with every, everything from a sloth to a sunflower to a spider. When you take a breath, put on a warm coat, wave to a friend, or move away from a buzzy bee, you are interacting with your environment and with other living things. Living things are always interacting with each other and with the non-living things in their environment. If you were to take a look at a number of different birds and focus in on each of their bills or their beaks, compare them to each other, what do you think is something that you would notice? You might notice that a robin's bill is different from a duck's and an owl's is different from a hummingbird's. All of these bills are used to gather food, but they are adapted or well suited to the food that that particular bird eats. Living things are adapted so that they fit their surroundings. This ensures that they can survive in the environment in which they live. For example, many of the bones in a bird's body are hollow. This characteristic makes the bird lighter so it can more easily fly. The fit between an organism and its environment is called adaptation. An adaptation is an inherited characteristic that helps an organism survive and reproduce in its environment. Sometimes characteristics that help animals survive in their environment are learned during the animal's lifetime. So for example, humans learn to look both ways before crossing the street. This helps humans survive, but it is not an adaptation because it is not 
inherited. Humans are not born knowing to look before crossing a street. Humans are able to survive, at least for short periods of time, in a wide variety of habitats. We have even ventured into space and the deep sea. Humans have used advances in science and technology to expand the different types of environments in which we can live. Did you know that there are more individual things living in a rotting log than there are people on Earth? Bacteria, tiny worms, other animals, fungi, and plants are all thriving in that small piece of decaying wood. Larger organisms use the log as well. A salamander might hide under the bark, and woodpeckers visit for a meal of insects. The log is an example of an ecosystem. An ecosystem is the interaction between living and non-living things in a particular environment. The ecosystem of a rotting log is formed by the interactions between the organisms living in and on the log. And the soil, temperature, other non-living features around the log as well. A forest is also an ecosystem. All of the living things such as trees and animals and all of the non-living things such as the sunlight and the air are interacting. Understanding how ecosystems function is all about understanding connections. All parts of an organism's world are connected. If one part is affected, climate, availability of water or food or habitat, the organism will need to adjust somehow. Some organisms adjust well, and others do not. When we know how an ecosystem functions, we can learn about the effects of changes on the ecosystem. Some ecosystems are easy to explore, but other ecosystems are more challenging. For example, if the ecosystem is too small or too big for us to observe easily, we can't always know what living and non-living things are present. In order to study ecosystems, scientists often study one aspect of an ecosystem. They then work with other scientists to piece together the overall picture of how the ecosystem functions. Imagine a great white shark cruising towards you through tropical waters. As a human, your only thought would be, get out of the way! Yet one small fish, called a remora, cannot get close enough. It uses suckers on its head to attach itself firmly to the shark's skin and then dines on bacteria and microorganisms that are unhealthy for the shark. Symbiosis occurs when two species live closely together in a relationship that lasts over time. The odd association between the fearsome shark and the little remora is an example of a symbiotic relationship called mutualism. Mutualism is a relationship between two different organisms in which each partner benefits from the relationship. Symbiotic relationships are common in the natural world. For example, aphids on a rosebush have a symbiotic relationship with the rosebush as they feed on it. Ants and aphids have a symbiotic relationship too. The ants protect the aphids from predators, and in return, they drink the sweet liquid that aphids excrete. There are three types of symbiotic relationships. Along with mutualism, there can be parasitism and commensalism. Parasitism is a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefits and the other organism is harmed. Typically, one of the partners lives on or in the other organism and feeds on it. One of the organisms, the parasite, meets its needs at the expense of the other organism, the host. 
tapeworms, for example, can live in the small intestines of human beings. They can even grow as long as 10 meters. They benefit by absorbing the nutrients from the human's food. The hosts, or the humans, are harmed because they do not get the nutrients from the food they eat. Tapeworm eggs live in meat or fish, so it's important to properly cook your food so that the heat will destroy those eggs. Commensalism is a symbiotic relationship in which one partner benefits and the other partner appears neither to lose nor to gain from the relationship. For example, many species of flowering orchid live high up attached to the trunks of trees. The orchids benefit by having a safe place to live and a constant source of water from rain dripping down the tree trunks. The trees seem neither to benefit nor to lose from the presence of the orchid. Symbiotic relationships are just a few of the ways in which organisms interact with one another in ecosystems. Recall that ecosystems are made up of organisms interacting with all of the parts living and non-living in an environment. As a result, all organisms have some kind of impact when they interact in their ecosystems. Some animals have a large impact on their ecosystem. For example, a beaver. They cut down trees to eat and to make dams. Well, that dam can drastically change the ecosystem in which the beaver lives. The stream below the dam dries up, and the fish that live in it can no longer survive. The animals that eat the fish can no longer live in the ecosystem either, so they have to move to another ecosystem. Above the dam, a new pond will appear. The presence of a pond has changed the types of animals that can live in that ecosystem. The impact of the beaver on its ecosystem has improved conditions for some organisms while making the environment unsuitable for others.